Hello everyone and welcome to the Eternal Spoiler Breakdown. We're live on Twitch and recording for YouTube. We're going to be talking about all of the different spoils for spoilers for Eternal Unleashed so far. Uh, so I did a small spoiler breakdown when uh, the Eternal kicked off because there was about like one or two small spoilers available. Since then, there have been a lot of community spoilers released. In addition, we have our own spoiler uh, thanks to uh, Tempest Dragon King. Uh, so thank you so much for... Uh, sending that to us, Tempest, and we will be reviewing that one at the end of this video. So uh, with that, let's get into it. We're going to be talking about each of these cards in turn, with whether they're good in Throne Expedition uh, or Draft slash Sealed Environments, also known as the Limited Environments, and uh, going to be talking about their design, talking about their power level, talking about just everything there is to talk about about these cards as far as we can go. All right, so First off, we got Homesick Yeti. This is a three cost one one with summon, reduce the co top cost of the top card of your deck by one. And ultimate, when you play five cards in the same turn, transform Homesick Yeti into Red the High Roller. This was released, I think, just today. Uh, there's a bunch of like fancy new spoilers available and uh, this one is pretty fun. So the main thing about it that's really good is that it has excellent art. Uh, we have a three cost one one that gives you a cost reduction on a card similar to like a miner's musket or something like that, except that the summon effect is a little bit uh, less uh, powerful. It does reduce the cost of spells notably. So you can get a lot of cards that normally can't have their cost reduced, reduced by reducing them with this. Uh, also, if you can give this card like warp in a warp deck, that kind of thing, there's some interesting shenanigans that are a little bit available to that, and that will also make it more easy to transform uh, Homesick Yeti into Red the High Roller, which uh, let's go ahead and open that up now and uh, show you the other side of this card. So, Red the High Roller, Homesick 2, here we go. Uh, at the start of your turn, play the top card of your deck, gain power this turn equal to its cost. So, 3 costs 3-3, three, three, which of course you don't pay the cost of this card, you transform this card. But, uh, basically, it's giving you the Lava Blood Goliath type, uh, or not the Lava Blood Goliath, the Great Kiln Titan style treatment, uh, or like the Birthright style treatment. If you're playing with decks that like basically want to play very large expensive cards, then this is something that can potentially help you out with that. Uh, the main problem with it, of course, is that the two sides of the card do not serve each other particularly well. For the first one, you have to fulfill a very specific quest, and if you succeed at that quest, then you get to play a really, really expensive card off the top of your deck if you're lucky, and then if you are all, if you get that really, really expensive card, you also get to play really, really expensive cards that are stuck in your hand. So this is the type of card that really supports red decks that want to play basically a mix of very, very small power boosting cards, like Power Burst and that kind of stuff, uh, little free bonuses, anything that can basically like play cards into other cards, uh, and then use that to transition into playing big eight or nine drops, dropping Doomsday Assemblies, dropping Great Kiln Titans. Uh, it is not an easy card to get a lot of advantage out of, specifically because a three cost one one on its own is just not very good. So you really wanna actually flip red or get some benefit out of red's summon effect to get the best benefit. But uh, like, because there are a lot of like useful things that you can do to sort of set this up, uh uh, as uh, Tempest here is pointing out, tokens count as this card, so a card like Assembly Line will produce four cards for you, the Assembly Line itself and the three Grenadines, and then you just have to play one more card off of that. So if you're playing small tokens into big things, suddenly this deck becomes like a lot more interesting. I think this is a really, really specific niche card. Uh, it does not work very well in limited formats. It's only okay in like very, very specific decks in Expedition or Throne. It's particularly good in Throne because Throne has access to a lot of different cards that can play multiple cards in a turn. Uh, it has access to those assembly lines. It can play basically anything that plays lots of tokens. It can play uh, free cards, power bursts, all of that stuff. And then its top end is just like really ridiculous because there have been a ton of eight and nine drops and 10 drops all just released over the course of many, 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 many sets of Eternal. So as a result, this card is probably strongest in Throne. In Expedition, it's a little bit harder to build a deck around, but uh, odds are that there's going to be a little bit of thematic support for it, and Red will have a little bit of a position when that happens. Uh, regardless, both sides of the car card are very cute. Uh, it also introduces a general theme that we're going to be seeing in most of these spoilers, which is this sort of like casino gambling theme, and which also relates to our spoiler. So uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting. All right, uh, next up, what do we got? 
So uh, these are going to be in no particular order primarily because uh, we don't have them organized by date released, but uh, Black Books Enforcer, I believe, was one of the ones that was shown off on the uh, draft setup. This is a, uh, or the, the draft event. So yeah, five cost, four, four, summon, choose another unit. Its strength and health become the higher of the two if it's yours, or the lower of the two if it's an enemy. So five cost, four, four is not an amazing stat line, but the card summon effect is pretty reasonable. It's not quite a kill uh, a unit type effect. It does uh, work to kill a unit if the unit has zero strength. Um, you can just basically turn that unit into a paste at that point. Uh, but it may mainly just makes a lot of units that would be otherwise like a lot more threatening, a lot less threatening, and can boost up cards of yours that are going to be like maybe in need of a little bit of boost. This like minor sort of sub theme where you can just make a big six health or eight health unit into an eight strength unit is where this card belongs the most but I think in most circumstances like even in like a limited context you're probably pretty happy to play a mid-range mid-cost unit that then provides you with a small amount of board advantage in the form of either weakening one of your opponent's cards or strengthening one of your cards and if the card doesn't get that summon effect it's still a 4-4 four, four for 5 which is pretty pretty okay. This is like, you know, just a general like B card. It's not like an amazing design. It's not an amazing power level, but it is something that actually just accomplishes a very specific goal and should fill out the uncommon slot in green really, really well. I think it's a pretty reasonable thing to sort of mess with uh, big, scary red decks and to make your big, scary walls into big, scary monsters, which, yeah, that's always a fun effect. The Shard of the Spire thing has been proven to be kind of fun to play with, but never immediately effective. All right, Skycrag Adept is next. Uh, so this is a 3-3 with your spells deal plus one damage, and uh, basically it just has... That is a solid bonus all on its own, like a 5 cost 3-3 three, three lit with flying that has your spells deal plus one damage would be a reasonable card in a limited format. If you're playing in a draft environment, like having something like this in Skycrag is just pretty standard. The summon is draw a spell that deals damage from your void and it gets void bound, which means you can't repeat the effect, but that does allow you to redraw cards like Channel of the Tempest, uh, anything that kills your opponent's stuff, Lightning Storm, etc., 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 Hailstorm, uh, and of course, small red burn effects, torches, piercing shots, all of which function as mild removal. There's going to be a card called Icicles that's spoiled a little bit later on. Um, between the card draw, the spell plus one damage, and the flying effect on this, this is a really, really solid limited card. Um, it gives you huge bonuses in terms of like overall reach. It gives you card advantage, and it gives you removal cards back uh, in the form of recursion, which is very, very important. Uh, a lot of Skycrag draft is generally going to be picking a lot of these and a lot of icicles and a lot of red burn. And then you can just between that and like a couple of cards to fill out your board and give you some like decent advantage. That's an amazing limited strategy for you. That should be okay. In expedition, this card is okay. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's strong enough to be in throne since there's a lot of different ways to draw cards from your void in throne. And the one that is uh, most relevant at the moment is a six cost four, four that has a stun enemy unit as its bonus. So uh, this is something where you're not getting quite as much benefit from that, especially since the card is very, very underpowered for its cost, um, like, or understated for its cost, rather, not so much underpowered. So reasonable expectation card, uh, a reasonable expedition card, uh, excellent draft card, and a pretty, uh, pretty mediocre to meh uh, throne card. All right, Concealed Derringers next up. Whoa, everything never fits the screen. None of these spoilers are ever the same size. And I'm going to complain about it on every YouTube video forever. <laughs> Okay, that did it. Uh, plus two, plus zero, Frenzy, the Wheeler gets quick draw this turn. Okay, so we talked about Frenzy last time around. I did uh, miss a particularly salient point, which is that when you... It does only does effects based on... I believe it's like... It's only effects that are not from units that are... <laughs> It's a little difficult to explain, but basically Frenzy triggers on damage instances that are not from attacking units. So uh, it won't trigger from something that is like, uh, say, a Brazen Daredevil or something along those lines, but it will trigger off of an auto tread. So, which is a very specific uh, delineation, but yeah, non-combat damage might be the best way to describe it. So uh, this is a card that basically allows you to use any sort of bolt effect, piercing shot, uh, anything that deals small amounts of damage to give a 
card quick draw while also giving it a plus two plus zero bonus. Overall, as a weapon, this seems like a pretty solid red option for expedition and draft decks because it just gives you the option to give one of your early one drop two ones uh, the ability to just run forwards and attack in with quick draw while also having like a pretty serious damage bonus. So pretty sick stuff going on and uh, that will like generally like work in a, a lot of exciting ways um so yeah like uh since you just have to deal it to like yeah it's since uh that is uh it's a somewhat difficult thing to trigger but there's going to be a lot of ways to actually trigger the frenzy as a result of that so uh yeah it's it's going to be be kind of kind of weird to play around with but i do think that the concealed derringer is a reasonable option in expedition and uh expedition and draft and uh only like kind of okay in throne and stuff like that because the card is just not like not crazy efficient for what it does it doesn't give you any extra survivability it does cost you a card for the aggression that you're adding so you really need cards that can actually trigger that frenzy ability early on so you know this is the kind of card that would make cards like brazen daredevil and uh, uh yeti snowchucker really really strong uh but uh because the attack triggers that deal damage to players do not actually work that way, uh, it's not quite as strong in those circumstances. You need other ways to trigger Frenzy. All right, so we were talking about Icicles a little bit earlier in the context of the 5 cost 3-3, but yeah, this is a staple workhorse for Primal. 3 cost, deal 4 damage, overwhelm. So it's a mini obliterate that is a little bit more efficient. It only costs 3 to deal 4, as opposed to 6 to deal 5, or 5 to deal 6 which uh, overall, this is a decent improvement on that particular setup. You have to be pretty deep in blue, but the basic idea is that you get a pretty solid removal card that gets rid of all of the standard like three cost three threes and three cost three fours that are gonna be the bane of your existence in pretty much any format. This is a card that I think will play really well in most situations. I'm not sure if it's going to replace like Ice Bolt or um, the, yeah, not sure if it's going to replace the uh, deal seven and your opponent plays a power in primal but uh like overall this is something that does give you removal and then also deals a little bit of excess damage over the top so you can do some cool stuff with uh, spell damage and that kind of effect so it's uh it's crazy nonsense and uh, i think it's very very uh, interesting uh overall i think this is something that is going to be a real draft staple and should also be pretty important in expedition this is something where even though the card seems a little underwhelming it's just so stable for what it's doing and at its cost that it's it's uh, probably going to be seeing some play in Expedition and might even see a little play in Throne. Wouldn't say it's an amazing option for Throne, but it's uh, Primal is always a little short on removal, so that's something that can definitely work out. All right, Clash of Wills. Uh, this particular spoiler for some reason does not have formatting, but it is a real card. Uh, six and red and a blue. Each player draws three cards and deal a damage to the enemy player for each card in their hand. So it's a mall. Um, if you are basically similar to the card Maul, M-A-U-L, uh, you get to deal damage to the enemy player for each card in their hand, but you also get to give them a bunch of cards in general to just sort of like whack them in the face for having too many cards in the first place. Uh, this is a really reasonable way to trigger... So it's a minor frenzy trigger. It deals a decent amount of damage. Your opponent gets to benefit from the card draw before you do because you're paying so much for all of that card draw. So if you're not using Clash of Wills to kill your opponent, then the extra cards that you're drawing will be helpful, but you really kind of have to be in a situation where your opponent is not playing aggressively enough to beat you out with whatever cards they draw. So if you're in like a like control deck matchup, Clash of Wills is going to be decently strong because both of you draw three cards, your opponent takes like 9 to 12 damage, something like that. But then, if you don't kill them, they probably drew their channel the Tempest and can just hit you straight back. So there is some disadvantage to this. I think it's not always going to be a perfect finisher. It's an excellent card to come out of a market or come out of a sideboard if you want to basically like just end the game very quickly and the extra cards do work really well if you have other ways to sort of like make them discard uh punish them for drawing multiple cards if you're playing like a time primal fire deck there's a lot of different ways to increase the cost of cards like this and uh that kind of stuff does mean that you can actually like just get some decent benefits out of it in draft this card is going to be a pretty good workhorse you can definitely use it to trigger frenzy which is going to be something that like 
basically in Skycrag, you're probably going to get into situations where you are attacking for lots of damage. You generally need a little bit more to push through. Clash of Wills can draw you into like cheap one drop to two drop spells that will just deal the damage you need. It can deal the extra damage and it can trigger the frenzy on all of your units in play. So this is a card to pick and draft as sort of a sort of near end game finisher, even though it is not particularly strong on its own. In Expeditioner's Throne, this is a market card, it's a sideboard card, it's a meta pick card. You're basically using this to counter out particular styles of deck, and in those particular styles of deck where people are playing like really, really defensively, it'll do something cool. All right, check raise. It's a counter spell. They get an enemy spell unless the enemy player pays three. That's a pretty significant amount of power to play. So this is very frequently just a fast spell that negates an enemy spell. Um, I think that like this just works as a counter spell for one. Uh, in most situations up until like your opponent's at like six or seven power. And so as a result, if you're playing a fairly aggressive Skycrag deck, which again, aggressive Skycrag does appear to be on the menu, uh, this is a card that just very frequently works as a cheap way to negate one of your opponent's spells and get a good bonus out of it. Um, Particularly good if you are like increasing the cost of their spells. Again, like this sort of like Praxis plus Skycrag setup where you are just in red, yellow, and blue and basically like increasing the cost of extra cards that they're drawing, that kind of thing. Check raise get continues to be relevant at that point. Um it's definitely not bad. And uh because like it's not like a debt or a contract or something like that, this card really encourages aggressive Skycrag decks to run a little bit of counter spell action and get some very good benefits from it. A uh, good card to protect your 3-3 flyers. Uh, in draft, usually counterspells are not quite as good, particularly mana leaks. They're good, but not amazing. Uh, in Expedition and Throne, this card is really, really solid. Uh, I think Throne will really like it because one power counterspells are just very worth it. And uh, in Expedition, like it's definitely going to be a role player in its particular color. So super worth it in that respect. All right, next up we got a uh, Maniacal Reveler. I mean, who doesn't need a little maniacal reveling in their life? So yeah, three cost one one whenever a unit goes to your void, maniacal reveler gets plus one plus one. So it's a soul collector, but without the entomb effect and in time. Um, it's also doesn't affect enemy units, which means overall this card is probably draft chaff. You get to play with this card if you are doing a lot of stuff to mill yourself or like basically creating some like interesting shenanigans to just eh, sort of set up like your own sort of self-destructive extra bonus deck. But I think that's a limited deck card only for the most part. It's a, it's a good strategy in a limited deck if you actually have the right support for it. And certainly something that you can potentially chase after because the card will just get bigger and bigger and bigger and cards that get bigger and bigger and bigger in limited formats are really, really strong. But three for something that is base 1-1 one, one is not going to be so anything that really like shakes the meta up in Expedition or Throne. This is still amazing art, uh, amazing card. I, I like cards that have good names, and Maniacal Reveler is an amazing name with uh, excellent flavor. Really like the design of this one. I think it's definitely specifically designed for a draft format. All right, sleight of hand. So this one is really interesting. We get to draw two cards, and then we get to transform each power card drawn this way into a snowball. Uh, three costs double blue, which uh, basically puts it in the same vein as Wisdom of the Elders, but the drawback is that you can't draw power off of it, which is a pretty significant drawback. A lot of times when you're playing a control-based deck and you want to actually be doing interesting draw effects, you usually want to draw power cards because like, that's half the reason to have the cards, so you can pick up your power card, pick up some more gas, and just keep everything really consistent as you are playing the control. Uh, instead, this turns the power cards into snowballs, which means that if you're playing an aggressive to mid-range deck that wants card draw, then you can really get some good benefits out of it. You get it to basically transform power cards into actual board position. Uh, there's a small like primal sigil hate thing in primal here, uh, which we'll be talking about a little bit more with one of my favorite spoilers of this particular setup. Uh, but like overall, this seems like a really reasonable card. Like Wisdom of the Elders is a really, really strong effect. Uh, the ability to generate snowballs gives you some really interesting extra board position and means that your Wisdom of the Elders 
elders are never dead draws. So if you're playing this as a way to just sort of like boost up a mid-range deck or boost up an aggro deck and actually get some good benefit out of it, and also you're playing this in like spell damage or something like that with Frenzy, uh, with the new effects, like it specifically supports Frenzy, which is definitely going to be a thing in limited formats. It specifically su supports spell damage bit steps, which uh, is always a thing in limited and Skycrag. So yeah, there's definitely some real benefits to this card, and I think it could end up being a role player in basically all three of the formats. So we'll see exactly how well it goes. It won't completely replace Wisdom of the Elders, because Wisdom of the Elders is going to be, always be strong for the reasons that it's strong, but uh, it is an interesting optional choice that allows you that you can change to if you're running a wisdom of the elder step and it's just not doing the right things for you all right nico urban hunter is up next assuming it's going to do that for me hi nico maybe no all right let's try that again one more time one more time we'll get into it all right nico can't block has frenzy uh, plus one strength and draw Nico from your void. So <laughs> this is a weirdly uh, organized frenzy because it kind of seems to indicate that Nico should be in your void, but I believe this triggers in either circumstance. So uh, you, <laughs> I'm not sure if the plus one strength triggers when Nico is in your void because that's usually not how things work. But I think in this case that might be the case. So uh, regardless, it's a two cost three one. Uh, and you get to boost it up with every frenzy effect that you can. And then, like, uh, basically, like, the extra frenzy just means that if you are making this card unblockable, this card will generally be hitting for, like, four or five and can even get up to, like, some really, really crazy nonsense. Uh, as a rare, it's kind of a draft bomb. Like, you're you're okay with this uh, in draft as a two-cost three-one that just gets really, really strong. But you do need to have unblockability or ways to give it flying. So it's kind of specific. You really got to build around this one a little bit. Um, but yeah, overall, like that's something that is decent. Like that frenzy bonus just means that like every time that you're dealing damage to your opponent with a spell, you are going to be getting like a little bit of a bonus. Uh, I think the can't block ability on it means that this card is probably not going to be amazing in Expedition or Throne. Uh, but the fact that it is a recurring threat that can be repeatedly played means that it's got a couple of unusual shenanigans. I think the one that like really sort of stands out to me is Inferno Phoenix. Uh, if you're playing a Stone Scar deck with Inferno Phoenix, then you this will get flying charge or double damage and will just be a constant threat to your opponent that can get more and more aggressive as time goes on. The more battle skills you give to Nico from different effects, the better off Nico gets because He's a recurring card, and recurring cards tend to get really, really nonsense when you can actually buff them up due to the permanence effects of Eternal's just general setup. Like, recurring advantage is a real thing, and this is something that really does it. All right, next up, this might be one of my favorites, uh, Sundown Accord. Sundown Accord is a six cost that says draw a spell from your void, then transform each primal sigil in your deck into a copy of that spell. <laughs> So I hope you like whatever spell you drew, because <laughs> you're going to be drawing it again a lot. Uh, so this is an unusual design for a number of different reasons, to be sure. I think that's Eileen, potentially, in the uh, art there, which is kind of notable. Like, this is a, like a Zoltan priest or like leader shaking hands with Eileen. The art's a little bit weird. It doesn't quite look like Eileen the way that it normally does, but, you know, like, it, it seems like it might be depicting an important event uh, in Argentport. So uh, just a notable thing about it. Uh, okay, so this basically turns all of your primal sigils into spells, which means that you never, ever, ever draw anything other than gas again. If you're already at nine power and you're using this to pick up a, cha a channel of the Tempest, then your deck is now full of channel of the Tempests, and you're likely going to win as long as your opponent doesn't kill you first. <laughs> Um, that kind of general effect is just really, really interesting. If you can reduce the cost of this card, that is, like, even better. Uh, there's a Lonely Yeti who can help out with that a little bit. Um, but, like, basically any time that you can actually, like, make this card a little cheaper and get something, like, really, really beneficial, that can be really, really cool because you then get to play wild, wild strategies where you just have 25 of a card that you like in your deck. 
Um, I think probably my favorite Sundown Accord target that I can think of so far uh, is that this is the most disgusting Static Bolt card I have ever seen. <laughs> Somebody else just named it. Uh, yeah, so like 25 Static Bolts in your deck and you're just drawing cards. <laughs> That's that's delightful. The static bolts continue to deal more and more damage every time you draw one, and uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty crazy. Um, yeah, there's just all of the potential for shenanigans with this one. It's a really interesting throne ex and expedition card. Um, I think in a draft, if you draw this, you're super happy. Like you get to pick up a crazy card. Like basically, like if you're in draft and you do this to an icicles you still are pretty well set to win the game because you're just going to draw a removal card that deals damage to your opponent every turn. Um, that kind of setup really gets to be crazy. Doing this to a sleight of hand, being able to just constantly draw... Well, actually, no, it doesn't work with sleight of hands because then you don't have any sigils left to turn into snowballs. <laughs> uh, you have to play pretty deep into Primal for this, so that does mean that if you are hybrid colors, you can still draw power which uh, is an advantage and a disadvantage. If you actually want to play a hybrid deck, Sundown Accord will be maybe even stronger because then you can't actually draw the missing power that you need after casting Sundown Accord. So you can still do some really interesting nonsense. You just won't get as many cool copies of the card into your deck. Uh, this is a late game payoff card, so I don't think it's going to be S tier by any means, uh, but it will make a lot of wonderful and probably obnoxious decks. <laughs> Okay, so next up we got Praxis Adept. Uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. When Praxis Adept hits an enemy player, you get that much power this turn. Uh, it's based on the damage, I believe. Uh, it doesn't say that, but I believe that's what's supposed to be happening. Uh, so yeah, if you can boost this card up, then this card gets quite a bit more nasty. Uh, it's a really interesting draft combo with the 2-0 Frenzy card, since you can basically use this to, like... Uh, figure out some interesting frenzy combos where you get extra power and then do some nonsense. I believe there's already been some like discussion of an infinite combo with this card. Uh, there's some interesting options available for it in Throne in particular. Uh, since this can trigger off of any sort of like hit effect that triggers off of a weapon, you can do some wild, wild things with this card very, very quickly. Uh, overall, I think this should be an interesting build around me card. It's not immediately strong on its own, but a mild 1-1 boost is really not the worst thing in the world for just playing a 1-1 one, one on turn 2, and then attacking on turn 3 into an empty board. Like, if you get up to your 4 drop off of that, you've already gotten something cool off of Praxis Adept. So, there's some real potential here. This card's got some wild strengths. It synergizes pretty well in draft with cards like Granite Acolyte and other things like that. Um, you have to actually hit your opponent with it, so it's not reliable in that particular respect, but that's a powerful effect to be putting onto a card, so definitely worth, uh, worth considering. All right. Uh, every time that, uh, we go into these, uh, spoiler sets, we're always looking for something to beat to help out our, like, FTK list, where we're trying to actually get the first turn kill. Uh, there's been basically nothing for a couple of different sets, but this is the first one that actually does something, and it's also just an insanely powerful card in its own right. Zoltan Conclave. Uh, so this is a power card that says, take two damage. Gain an influence of your choice. Two damage is a lot of damage. You have to really know what you're doing to be playing this card. Um, basically, if you are willing to take the two damage to get that much flexibility, you're probably running a specific combo or something that is just like going to want to play multiple colors to do something nonsensical and needs to hit it reliably every time. Um, however, if that is what you are paying for, the damage that you take is inconsequential. Like, if you're just looking for a weird four-color combo, this card just enables that in a way that is devastating and potentially very broken. This is, like, a real dangerous design. And so it's gonna be interesting, in throne formats in particular. In draft or expedition, I don't think you're really gonna want to play this very often, but, uh, you know, it is nonetheless a colorless power that does some interesting interesting things and the self damage could potentially be used to trigger some like other very beneficial effects but like the thing about this is that if you include four copies of it in your deck that means that you're pretty likely to take four to six damage over the course of a game and that is an amount of damage that you are not going to be so willing to take 
uh, for that power. Uh, this is a dangerous, dangerous card, uh, and I think the power level of it can be completely off the charts. Let's certainly hope that it's designed in such a way that it is not. So we will see how that goes. <laughs> uh, regardless, we're going to be running in our FTK decks all the time because we are trying to generate uh, FTK combos, and they require more than one color, and they require undepleted power that can play in more than one color. <laughs> so here we go. All right. Tomb of the Azure Mage. So... Let's go ahead and fit that there. All right, Frenzy, draw a card, discard a card. So anytime you deal damage to somebody with a spell, you just get to draw and discard. Not too bad. Free loot, definitely a reasonable thing to have on a relic that's cheap. The ultimate is pay nine to deal one damage to the enemy player for each spell in your void, which uh, if you are actually using this Frenzy multiple times, that's a killer. Uh, I think this card seems very, very reasonable in a Skycrag draft setup. Uh, any type of limited format setup, you get to basically just uh, deal a bunch of damage to your opponent with spells, crack them with icicles a couple of times, and then way late in the game, when things are finally starting to stall out, you pay nine, you deal seven to eight damage to their face, and then they're dead. Like, that's just sort of how this card works. Um, overall, the design of it seems pretty strong. I think it's going to be something that's more expedition or limited focused as opposed to a particularly strong throne card. But you get good benefits out of this. And overall, slots in pretty well. Not too expensive. <coughs> Doesn't provide you with immediate board advantage and you got to play it on two. But, you know, like, that is not a lot to pay for the card. So, seems okay. Collaboration. This is fun. Draw a card for each faction among your units. Uh, so up to five cards for five power. And it's colorless, which is pretty decent. Um, I think overall, this is not too hard to play in like a stranger deck. It just gives you a ton of card draw. Um, it's a real specific type of deck that you are playing. Uh, it is not too powerful for what it is doing. Uh, if you are playing a five color deck, you have incurred upon yourself a disadvantage that is definitely going to be something that you need some advantages to make up for. And being able to pay five to draw a card for each faction is definitely a solid advantage on that front. So uh, yeah, if you're setting down your like Nick Tetraxian or whatever it is that you want that uh, has that five colors all set up, then you're going to feel pretty good about this. If you're playing a, card, a deck that just has a lot of like three color card combos and like, you know, basically you're just playing like, uh, I think it's, is it zoo format? I think it's called. Um, there's a really interesting deck there too, where you're basically just playing like very high influence cards or uh, rather very scattered influence cards. The best of five colors is now really available because you have the power card that allows you to play whatever power you want. And then you can just start playing weird hybrid cards that are the best of each format and get some extra card draw on top of that. It's got some potential strengths. It's definitely a slow card draw card, so I'm not particularly concerned about his power level, but I do think it opens up a style of deck that hasn't previously been particularly playable in Eternal. All right, we're down to two more. Endangered Kirin, Flying Endurance plus one maximum power. All good things. 2-1, got a really, really good bonus effect, and uh, the plus one maximum power is exceptional. Like, this card just does everything you kind of want it to do, uh, while also being like a pretty reasonable, nasty monster. I think uh, plus one maximum power is better on a one drop than a two drop, but getting this on a two drop that also has flying means, yeah, this is a power power card in draft, and uh, it is probably one of, gonna be one of your most commonly picked uncommons in that particular color. Uh, in Expedition, yeah, super worth playing, seems really good, can't be permafrosted. Uh, in Throne, I mean, you're basically not starved for options in Throne. I think the only card that's better than this for two-cost power boosts is the zero one one that gives Killer, because that one just provides you with, like, actual onboard presence, and that's really, really important. Endangered Kirin, though, like, yeah, can't really argue with a card that can actually kill you that also gives you maximum power at a reasonably efficient rate. Very, very cool. All right, next up, we got Gift of the Arcanum. All right, this is a this is a dumb M card if I've ever seen one. Like, uh, yeah, this is this is definitely uh, <laughs> definitely something that we've uh, we've played around with in the future. So, gift of the arcade on plus three maximum power. At the start of your turn, gain the power you didn't spend last turn. Uh, yep, that's uh, that's pretty much everything that uh, we're often looking for. So. Um, Going from six to nine means that you generally get to play like really, really expensive time and fire cards in Praxis. So this is notably a pretty strong Praxis card for that particular reason. The 
at the start of your turn, gain the power you didn't spend last turn means that you can accumulate power at such a rate as to just win the game through flame blasts or things like that. Um, you can just get like 30 to 40 power very, very quickly. There's one other card that has this text already. It's uh, the fancy Talir that can time warp at 33 power. And getting to 33 power after you have something like this out is not very difficult. Uh, in addition, I believe that the two stack on top of each other. So if you're playing the Talir time warp deck, this is kind of like an interesting late addition to that that allows you to play the cards and just get like, the even faster accumulation of power. Uh, is paying six for a relic that doesn't do anything on the turn that it's played bad? Yes. Yes, it is. It is not something that is going to give you a lot of board presence. It's going to give your opponent all of the opportunity in the world to kill you. And then the bonus is that like in maybe two turns, this starts kicking and gives you just a ridiculous amount of nonsense. Uh, but like, there's a lot of delayed gratification on this card, and if you are not getting the thing that you want, then, well, like, uh, I don't know. This is not something that's going to be uh, too crazy. People are pointing out that this looks like a birthday cake. It is a planetarium, but I appreciate that uh, I appreciate that it does look like a birthday cake. Uh, it is... Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent gift as well. <laughs> um, or not a planetarium. Solarium? What, what do you call a thing that's just like a... A scale model of a star system. Not sure. Either way, this card's really fun. Uh, definitely we're going to build some shenanigans with this. Clearly it's up to some nonsense. Uh, clearly it's not very good. And, I mean, those are cards after our own heart. So we're very much into those. All right. One last second. Seasonal allergies are fun. Uh, okay, so... Last one, and this is our spoiler. Uh, so this is courtesy of uh, Tempest Dragon King. They gave us one, and uh, we're going to be talking about it. Um, so uh, we have this sort of gambling sub theme in uh, the current setup. A lot of the art takes place in casinos, and uh, we have a casino-based card in red. This is full tilt, and of course it's uh, going to need to fit. Full tilt. Uh, six cost, double fire. Each unit deals damage to itself equal to its strength. Uh, this is a design that I've seen, I think, in magic cards before. Uh, it's a, generally like a red-yellow effect for like four, something like that. Uh, so it's not like... Uh, yeah, ridiculous nonsense, ridiculous nonsense. Um, it is a pretty reasonable effect for red decks to basically get their own sort of harsh rule style effect, which typically they just don't have the option to do that. Uh, there are certain things that certain colors cannot do. Uh, red is not very good at board wipes or like most types of removal. Uh, Shadow has a hard time dealing with relics, etc, etc. And then like there are certain cards that at cost allow you to sort of move around those restrictions in ways that are uh, a bit more interesting. With full tilt, each unit deals damage to itself equal to its strength. This also applies effects, of course, including like deadly um, double damage. I don't think overwhelm. Um, it's possible that you could get a unit to overwhelm itself and deal damage back to your opponent's face, but I'm pretty sure that that doesn't work. Um, but life steal, anything like that, uh, all of that kind of stuff actually does apply to full tilt, which is generally really interesting. I think that's a that's a cool bonus for full tilt style decks if you want to have units sort of like self-destruct in weird ways. Um, because this is a big wrath effect, you can use it to trigger certain effects that are going to be very, very happy for red wraths. Um, the one I can think of right off the bat that's like kind of important or kind of good in a large power situation is Doomsday Assembly because it makes a bunch of ticking grenadins, and Full Tilt then causes those grenadins to self-destruct and blow, blow themselves up. Uh, but killing your own deadly units, uh, killing units that have more strength than health, and the majority of units do have more strength than health, so this is something where you actually get to basically like mess up your opponent's stuff because they are just playing an aggressive strategy, and as a result, if this card sees like a decent amount of play, it can shift the meta in that quite a bit. Uh, the cost, on the other hand, is definitely a concern. Um, this is a six cost card where previously, like you might see this effect a little bit cheaper in red. I think you can print this card cheaper and it's not necessarily going to make the card overpowered in any format. Like this is something where it's, 
it's definitely in that sort of limited space uh, where it's more powerful in those particular shenanigans. Like it's something more of a draft card than it is a uh, expedition card or throne card. In throne, I feel like this is something that you're going to be pretty happy to have in a market because basically red just doesn't have wrath effects. So having something that you can throw into a market that allows you to just blow up everything on the board uh, can be really, really effective. And if you have the right type of strategy to set it up, then you're going to be feel pretty happy about that. There are a couple of other things that can make this like a little bit more worth it. Uh, notably, if you or your units are playing with a regen strategy, then full tilt is not going to kill those units, which is kind of a big deal if you're trying to go in for a big final hit push. Uh, if you are playing with something that can like actually sort of, uh, if you're playing with a lot of lifesteal, then full tilt is going to stabilize you in a way that may help a little bit for recovering from the wrath effects. Uh, if you're playing with just like other unusual shenanigans where you just kind of get like extra benefits from in tombs or any other type of effect, Stone Scar is the most common color. This is a card that can kind of blow things up and do a little bit more than that. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly powerful card. I think that uh, Limited is definitely the format that it's most interesting interesting in because it means that in limited this card has a real impact on the meta uh cards that have less strength than health are actually going to be a lot more relevant because red has an uncommon board sweeper that costs uh an amount that you can pay in red in draft um so like this is something where you actually like have to start considering it for draft or limited environments and you do have to actually pay attention to it um in expedition it's really a question of how high power level the expedition set is if it is a like there are a lot of like really really good cards in general and a lot of those really good cards have less strength than health you're never going to see this card in expedition if there are markets you're more likely to see it in expedition and i think it's going to be a little bit more uh interesting in that respect but uh overall i think the power level of the card is eh, kind of kind of just okay Nonetheless, this is definitely something that makes a difference. Uh, it is something that Red uh, couldn't do before, and Fire can now just do that, which uh, is definitely an important thing to have. As a result, you're fairly likely to see this card, I think maybe even in Throne, but only in situations where it is coming out of the market to just, yeah, do a board-wide sweep. And there are not that many cards in red that can do that, so that is definitely something to keep track of. Uh, <laughs> Final note, it has uh, art uh, where, of course, uh, the character is flipping the table. Uh, I believe we have a, like, we had a card design that we were considering running for a, like, influence sweep that was, like, a flip the table effect, and it was, I think, gunslingers have deadly, and then each unit deals their damage to a, a random enemy unit. Uh, very cute kind of flip the table stuff, but uh, obviously we're, we're going to have to consider something different this time around. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Overall, cool art, interesting things going on. We definitely have this like casino theme going on in Argentport, and that's going to be... I'm curious to explore that. I, I, I am excited to see if we have some mechanics coming out in the future that are going to be like related to gambling or, or in some way just like somehow related to this like sort of like general like sub theme of uh, a gambling hall that appears to be pretty common but uh yeah it's it's definitely pretty interesting uh and uh one final note from uh, tempest who uh, supported this card is that this is a good response to waxing moon a card that gives units deadly every other turn on your opponent's side so if this card is current if the, your opponent plays a waxing moon and you play a full tilt then you can just blow up stuff in a really interesting way and like that's pretty relevant like if you're playing in like red yellow green like three color cards where basically you have like a lot of units that have less strength than health and then you play a full tilt then you get like a one-sided board wrath that then leads you into a bunch of other exciting ridiculous shenanigans and that can be really really fun uh yeah so that's full tilt uh and that is our final spoiler of the day uh i hope you enjoyed we're definitely excited about all of this stuff coming in unleashed it's looking like an excellent draft format as per usual i really think that eternal's design uh is eternal has the best limited format is sort of my feel on it uh, compared to other card games. It is just like the most fun to play with. And so it's always exciting to review these cards and see what the limited format's going to look like and where it's gonna go. Cause like, this is an exciting and fun and relatively cheap limited experience that is just really, really exciting to play. And uh, I'm very excited to see all of these cards on May 11th to 
play around in the limited format, do some really, really interesting shenanigans there, and of course, to build more brews and get some more exciting stuff out there for all y'all. So thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed. Uh, I will be back for another stream on May 11th, so stay tuned for that, YouTube folks. Uh, for the Twitch folks, we are definitely going to keep playing right now, and uh, we'll see if we get back into some more Eternal stuff uh, over the rest of the next few weeks, I think that's fairly likely. So you can tune in to me at twitch.tv slash okapojo to check that out. Uh, in the meantime, all of the other spoilers as they come out will be reviewed on our YouTube channel, so you can check that out there. And we have another channel for Arkham and other like ridiculous shenanigans called Games With Them, which is linked in the YouTube description below. Thanks so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.